Our next speaker is Kimmy Rogers. Before joining us at Scripps, Kimmy spent the past five years shepherding teenagers on sailboats, kayaks, underwater, and on land as an outdoor educator and trip leader. As an outdoor educator, she noticed a lot of problems the ocean faced that people were unaware of. So she came to Scripps to help create solutions. Kimmy is a deep thinker who has far-reaching interests and skills. Just during her time here at Scripps, she did a policy paper on white sharks for Wild Coast. She took the scientific diving course and got that credential. And she booked herself a contract uh, making films for a client, along with Surfgrass Productions, who I have to give a shout out to Surfgrass as alumni of the, of the last year's cohort. She also sat on the student council and represented the students in this room today on behalf of the MAS programs, which is an incredibly important role, especially this year. So for that, we're all grateful. And last, she instituted Water Wednesdays. <laughs> no small feat, and just as important, mental health and well-being were also incredibly important this year, and she was the enthusiastic cheerleader for getting people out in the water, surfing, and experiencing the ocean even as recently as yesterday, to sort of get rid of some of the stress and remember why we're all in this room in the first place doing this kind of work. So Kimmy really has such a broad set of interests and experiences and interests. Today, she's going to talk to us about fishing in international waters. And her title is Trade Secrets, Examining the Impact of the European Union's Carding Scheme to Combat Illegal, Unreported, and unregulated fishing on Panama's seafood trade. It's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Samantha. And I'll give Josh credit for coordinating yesterday's water adventures. <laughs> so, but um, I'd like to start off with this photo of me uh, studying abroad in Panama in 2014. Uh, that semester, I learned about the interconnectedness between people and the environment and that environmental problems are often human-caused ones. So this year, I returned to Panama remotely to learn about one of the greatest human-caused threats our ocean faces. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or IUU fishing. IUU fishing threatens ecosystems and directly harms people who are unintentionally involved. The seafood supply chain is ripe with human rights abuses, including modern-day slavery at sea all so that we can have cheap seafood. Another reason IUU fishing is so problematic is actually invisible. So if we take a look at this time series by the FAO, or the Food and Agriculture Organization, they start their data in 1950 and go all the way up to 2016. And then on the y-axis, we see that there is an increase in uh, millions of tons of weight of fish caught. So this orange chunk here is capture production, otherwise known as wild caught production, and, that, and that's the one I'm focusing on. So if we take a look here, it looks as if it's, in, it's uh, plateaued. But in reality, scientists have found that not only should this orange piece be much bigger, it is actually declining, which is problematic if we need fish for our food, which we do. So how do you stop IUU fishing? It's a simple question with no simple answer. The high seas are considered the wild west, where there are few rules and even fewer regulations and fewer people to enforce them. So I look to the European Union, who is the, considered the biggest seafood importer of the world, and they are also considered the global leader to combat IUU fishing. So I looked at the European Union because they developed a market-based approach to prevent IUU fishing and incentivize countries to not participate in illegal fishing. And this is the foundation of my project. I wanted to learn more about what the European Union is doing, and it specifically, I wanted to learn about something called the carding scheme, which I will get into in a moment. So this was really interesting to me because of Panama. And Panama is going to be more than just why I studied abroad, but it's something that was really interesting because of this carding scheme. So this is an, the carding scheme. It's a critical component of the European Union's IUU regulation to prevent illegal fishing. There are three cards, yellow, red, and green. Before the commission gives any cards to a country, they begin a dialogue with them to understand the systems in place to prevent IUU fishing. Should the commission find that they're not doing enough to prevent illegal fishing, they give them a warning 
or a yellow card. If the country continues to not improve their fishing and not improve illegal fishing, then the EU will give them a red card, which results into a straight trade sanction. This trade sanction prevents that country from being allowed to export their seafood products to the EU. But if the country does improve their IUU fishing and creates rules and regulations to prevent it, they will be delisted from a yellow or red card. Here is a map of what the carding scheme's impact looks like right now. Currently, there are nine, nine countries that are yellow carded, three that are red carded, and 15 that are green carded. The country that I'm most interested in is Panama. Pan Panama is located along a highly productive and nutrient-rich area of the Pacific Ocean, and, is, and it employs 45,000 people in the fishery industry. And Panama was one of the first countries ever yellow carded by the EU for not doing enough to prevent illegal fishing. And not only were they one of the first yellow carded, they were the first country to receive a yellow card twice. The first time was in 2012 for not including enough fishery regulations in their legal frameworks. In 2014, after implementing uh, a stronger legal framework, they were given a green card. But then in 2019, they were considered to not uh, follow that legal framework well enough, so they were given that second yellow card. Now, this indicates that the European Commission is determined to continue to work with countries to ensure that they are cooperating and willing to work with the EU. So for my project, I wanted to understand what it was that Panama was doing and if the yellow card was truly influencing their seafood trade. So I wanted to look at publicly available data sets to understand what was happening uh, to Panama and their seafood products after the EU regulation gave them the first and second yellow cards. I wanted to know, did their fishery products continue business as usual? Did European partners get spooked by the potential sanction and bail on Panama? Or did Panama search for new pa partners to send their catch to instead? So I looked at how Panama seafood products to the EU changed over time. The results could give insight into if the yellow card is enough incentive to combat IUU fishing. But before we get into how yellow cards impacted Panama's trade, let's take a look at overall fisheries production in Panama. Here you will notice on the graph that it is gradually increasing up until 2001. But in 2001, what we're going to notice is that it is decreasing substantially compared to previous years. Now this, is the, this yellow line represents the first yellow card and the green line represents the first time it was delisted. The second yellow card is not on here since there was no data available for 2019 by the FAO. Now we're going to take a look into the EU's imports of Panama seafood products. This is another time series, so if we take a look at the bottom of the graph, we will see that there are months and years. So these are monthly imports by the EU from Panama seafood. And on the y-axis, we will see the amount of fish that they imported by tons. Now this first chunk is what we're going to look at first, and we're going to see that the fisheries imports in the EU declined steadily. After the first yellow card and before the, the first green card, it increased a little bit. And in between the first green card and second yellow card, it fluctuated a lot. And in the, after the yellow card, it declined. However, by looking at this graph, it's very hard to tell if there was any significant change in these yellow cards and if it impacted them severely. So next, I wanted to know more about which countries of the EU were importing from Panama. And so we're going to take a look at this graph or map here, and we will see that the gray countries are countries that did not import any seafood products from Panama. But the yellow tan ish countries imported a little bit, and the dark orange represents the country that imported the most. And this is Spain. So Spain imported way more seafood products from Panama than any other country, and the second country that imported the most was Portugal. Collectively, these two countries imported over 90% of Panama seafood to the EU. So we're going to take a look and dive in a little bit deeper into how Spain and Portugal's imports from Panama changed over time. In this graph, 
you'll see that uh, Spain and Portugal had vastly different amounts of seafood imports. So Spain, though, looks as if it's declining their imports from Panama over time, while Portugal looks like it's increasing its imports from Panama over time. And this is really interesting. I was not expecting to find that both Spain and Portugal would have opposite um, effects uh, from Panama. So we're going to take a look at this graph, but a little bit more closely. And we're going to take a look at how, the, how Spain and Portugal differ. So Spain and Portugal differ not only because Spain is gradually decreasing their imports and Portugal is gradually increasing them, they also differ by the species that they import from Panama. Spain imports primarily skipjack tuna and yellowfin tuna, while Portugal primarily imports sharks and swordfish. So Spain probably imports more tuna from, from Panama because they have a huge tuna canning industry in their country. It's one of the biggest in the world. So they're going to be importing a lot of skipjack and yellowfin tuna. And this might also be why some of their fisheries decline over time, because maybe perhaps there was changes in price. For Portugal, though, they are a really interesting country because they've been increasing their imports from Panama primarily after they were yellow carded. This is not the first time Portugal has started importing more after a country was yellow carded. They had a similar response after Korea and Taiwan had received a yellow card. So this indicates that Portugal might be an entry point for high risk seafood products entering into the EU. Because not only is Portugal importing more high risk seafood products, they're re-exporting it to other countries within the EU. So is Spain truly actually decreasing their imports from Panama or are they just getting it from Portugal? So my question was, how does the yellow card impact Panama's seafood trade? So we noticed that Panama's catches are declining over time from 2001 up till now. And that also aligns with Spain's imports from Panama are declining. So it's possible that these two things are happening right in line with each other. Or maybe Spain is actually declining their imports to try and be a good player in the fight to combat IUU fishing. Meanwhile, Portugal is increasing their imports, so they are, they are not necessarily aligned with the IUU regulation. And for me, this emphasized that the EU really needs to make sure that all of its member states are on the same page in the fight to prevent IUU fishing. So what would I do next? What I would want to do is speak with Panama's government and industry one-on-one -on -one to learn more about what it is that they are doing and see their perspective about the EU carding scheme and how it influences their fisheries. I would also want to speak to EU member states and representatives to understand what it is, um, how their EU carding works, and why Panama was chosen so much more often. But also, I want to speak with them because their transparency is a little bit difficult to follow. And then lastly, I will talk about the last point and not the flags of convenience, but that's a really interesting one. I will talk about Ghana's yellow cards. Ghana was recently given a yellow card uh, as of two weeks ago. This is the second time it's received a yellow card. So it'd be really fascinating to compare both Ghana's yellow cards and its impacts on trade to Panama's. And lastly, these are some of my recommendations. The EU should make carding processes more transparent. It's very difficult to find how Panama has responded. It's really easy to find why the EU finds all these problems, but not as easy to find what Panama is doing about it. And then lastly, I would really, would really love if catch and trade statistics improved. So thank you so much to everybody on my capstone committee for your commitment and very honest feedback. Uh, thank you, Andrew Johnson, Bubba Cook, David Victor, and Steve Stos. And then thank you to Samantha and everybody on the NBC cohort and the program and my family. So thank you. Looks like we have a question in the back in the live audience. Hi, Kimmy. Um, I was curious about uh, the general effectiveness of the yellow card, right? So you talked to us about how, you know, Spain is sort of 
going down over time, but I didn't see anything sort of sharp after the cards. Were you expecting to find something sharp after each card? And if so, what do you make of this? Or, or if not, why not? Yeah, thank you, Mark. That was a good question. Um, so I was expecting to find that Panama, that the imports in the EU would decline over time. And maybe not a sharp, sharp decline, but I expected that they would decline over time. So Spain's uh, results were slightly similar to that, except for its peak in 2014. Um, but over time it declined, whereas Portugal's just was totally different than what I expected to find. Thanks, Kimmy. Oh, oh yeah. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just ask this question and then we'll go to you, Melissa, if that's okay. Oh, what were some of the challenges or limitations of doing this project, Kimmy? Yes. One of the biggest challenges and limitations is the the trade and catch statistics that are available. Um, I think probably a lot of people that have worked with fisheries data in this room were probably frustrated with how, how inaccurate some of it felt. Um, and you weren't getting, for example, I was not, uh, Panama had reported swordfish uh, landings, but they had not shown every year. They had only shown the landings for 2014, so that didn't give me a clear idea as to how swordfish catches changed over time. So that's super problematic when you're trying to figure out what's going on in the oceans. So that was one of my biggest challenges. And then do EU policies that change for fisheries regulation affect then the carding system? Do countries that are subjected to the carding system get a heads up when these policies change? So do these countries get a heads up when these policies change? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. And it's a little bit confusing as to how early they know when they're going to, when the carding uh, system will take place. And I think it will depend on the country, which, like how early they, knew, they know. I think some of it is a little bit of gossipy and they're like, oh, this is going to happen, but it's not official. Um, so they do know it's going to happen and that could affect a response as well. Thank you.